Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless your presence tonight in our midst. We glorify your name again tonight. We celebrate you as always. We lift up the dear of God, pure heart and pure voices to you tonight. Be exalted, be magnified, be lifted up high and higher again tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, church. Thank you so much for coming again in the presence of the Lord tonight. Amen. It's always a blessing, always excitement to be in the presence of God when we come in his presence. Because we know that God is the one who changes things. God is the one who transforms things. God is the one who take things and turn them around for his glory. For his glory. Amen. We are in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to pray. Tu vas demander au Seigneur de te parler ce soir. Que la parole de Dieu puisse te parler ce soir. You're going to surrender all in the hands of the Lord and let the Spirit of God minister to you. Don't just look at the vehicle that he's using tonight, but keep your eyes on him. Trust that God will even speak through donkeys can speak to you tonight. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We are grateful for your presence in our midst again tonight. So grateful for what you have done. So grateful for keeping us moving in our lives, touching us, and making it possible for all of us to be in your presence again tonight. So we come with thanksgiving, oh God. May you receive again our worship tonight as fresh aroma. We ask you to bless this word. We ask you to visit each one of us in a special way. For this is indeed a, 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 the time that you have set for us to come tonight to receive this word. This is a word for today. Not for tomorrow, not for yesterday. But this is a word for such a time as this one. May you bless this word. Bless the speaker. Bless the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Gospel of Mark. That's where we are. We are making our way through this gospel. And we want to talk to you. I told you that this study will be mostly based on actions and actors, so to speak. Why? Because the gospel of Mark is a, a gospel of action. The word that we see coming back and back is the word immediately. It's a gospel of action. So we're taking that approach, action. So we talk to you about people, special people through the gospel of Mark and also special events through the gospel of Mark. Amen. Special people and special events. We began by talking to you about John the Baptist. And last time we had a special event, the baptism of the Lord. Amen. The baptism of Jesus Christ. That's what we spoke about last time. So I am in uh, chapter 1. I'm going to read now from verses 12. Verses 12 through 15. Now we're going to start with the Gospel of Mark tonight. But we will be borrowing from the Gospel of Luke or Matthew because they just talk about this event a little bit more explicitly. Mark chapter 1 verse 12, the word of God reads, The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Amen. That, that's all I want to talk about tonight. Immediately after his baptism. Now, we understand that he was baptized because he wanted to identify with the people that he came to minister to. 
he was baptized also by obedience. For he came to fulfill completely the purposes of the Father. Remember, Jesus came, and he came to do everything that the Father. It's almost like they send you on a mission, and then they give you a letter. They give you a letter, and they say, this is the roadmap. This is what you're supposed to do. And yet, the person who sent you is watching your back. So he got sent out in the midst of the people. He took the form of a man we saw that in Philippians 2. And he came to live like a man in the midst of men. And so it, the first thing he does is to identify with the men that he came to minister to. He goes ahead and he gets baptized even though he has no sin. A baptism of repentance has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, church. You repent from sin. Is that right? Because you have sin in you, you repent. But here's a man who never sinned. And yet, he goes ahead and accepts to be baptized. The last word that we read in verse 11, we heard a voice coming from heaven. And the voice was very specific saying, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. So God bring this affirmation to the son, telling him, I love you. Amen. I love you. Uh, don't let anything uh, kind of really fool you. I want you to know deep inside of your, your spirit and your heart that I love you. But then something weird, I should say, something uh, bizarre happens right after that. How can you have the affirmation of a father? How can you have God, the father, saying, I love you? And immediately, the word says, immediately, Satan drove him to the wilderness. Is that what he says? No. That's not what he said. He didn't say Satan drove him in the wilderness. The word said, the spirit with capital S. He means the Holy Spirit, the spirit of a living God. The spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. Wilderness is an interesting place. Is that right? The wilderness is the place where the people of God turn around and around and around for 40 years. The wilderness is the place where they had the opportunity to obey God and they did not obey God. Wilderness really brings us to think of uh, difficulties, a place where you, you feel uh, uh, alone, so to speak, in this case. The word says, and he was in the wilderness. How many days? Forty days. Forty days he did not eat. Forty days he was fasting. And he was not alone. He, he, was, he had very good company. Wild animals. I don't know about you, but I don't like wild animals. Here's a man fasting and praying alone in the wilderness, but he find himself with wild animals. He was, he was sent, the word says, to be what? Tempted by Satan. Tempted by Satan. That's what I want to talk about tonight. That's what I said I'm going to borrow from the Gospel of Matthew because Mark just mentions it and then he moves on. He just talks about it. He just said Jesus went to the wilderness. He got tempted by Satan and then he went on and he said it was the angels came and ministered to him. Well, there, there, there are a little bit more. There is a little bit more than this. What happened in the wilderness? He got tempted. Uh, temptation is something that all of us deal with. Temptation is part of this Christian life, if you are honest with me. Temptation, and yet in James 1, let's turn to James 1, 13, I believe. The word says that God is not the one who tempts us. So already, it looks like we have a small problem. James 1.13, you can write it down and maybe turn there later. But it, it says that God does not tempt us. But if we are tempted, it's all because of our own uh, fleshly desires, our, the, the things that are wrong in us. Uh, those are the things that cause us to be tempted and to fall into temptation, right? But if God does not tempt, the word here says, the spirit, though, led him in the wilderness to be tempted. Amen. 
The same word that is used, translated tempted, is the same word that is also used to be tested. Temptation is, can be viewed in, in, in two different lights. Because if you're not careful, when God brings a test into your life, and you are not discerning, and you don't have a discernment, discerning spirit to see or understand that it is God who brought the test, you will fail the test, and it will become a place of temptation for the devil. It will become an opportunity then for the devil to tempt you. God allowed his son to be in the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy as he himself is testing the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, here's important to understand that Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. Amen. Some things are a little bit more difficult to get into and maybe make clear. But we understand that he is a man with 100% men and 100% God. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. I want us to read the, the episode of the temptation. What happened? We establish one fact that God does not tempt people. God tests us. He does not tempt us. And yet the testing of God can turn into a temptation because the opportunity is then given by the devil because he's always around us trying to derail us from, from, our purpose, from God's purposes in our lives. I want to read Matthew 4. And I know we're in the Gospel of Mark. It doesn't mean we can't go to Matthew. Matthew is not going to get mad. <laughs> okay. Matthew 4, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Clear, to be tempted by the devil. In other words, he was brought into the, into the, uh, the wilderness, and the opportunity then is given to the devil to bring him to change what, the reason why he came. In the wilderness, as he faces one-on-one uh, -on -one with the devil, and the opportunity is given to the, uh, the devil to bring him to change the reason why he came. And after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Amen. Now, I know the Bible doesn't talk about any, every detail. He said he was hungry. He didn't, he didn't say he was thirsty. Should we put thirst and hunger together? Maybe. We don't know. It's not that important. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. That's the first temptation. We're going to go through the three of them. If you are the son of God, you will see that every time we read a temptation, we start with if you are the son of God. But we established that just before Jesus got into the wilderness, God taught him, this is my beloved son. This is the one I love. So clearly, he knows he is the son of God. And God knows this is his son. Apparently, the devil himself knows that this is also the son of God. Because if he did not know it, if he did not believe it, he would not have said it. If you are the son of God, command these stone to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, and set him on the uh, pinnacle of a temple and said to him, again, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on the end, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil, he doesn't let up. He doesn't give up. He comes, he keeps coming. Again, the devil took him to the 
very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all this I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Mark also mentioned that. Amen. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is God. Jesus is also man. Let me start by saying that Jesus was tempted as man, not as God. Jesus was tempted as man, not as God. Because God cannot sin. God is not a sinner. God is holy. There's nothing wrong in God. God cannot be tempted. But we, as we go through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, we understand that he, uh, he, he behaves as a human being just like you and I because he cried, didn't he? We just read I was hungry. God is, doesn't get hungry. God does not cry. He cried. He was hungry. So he had a human nature. And yet we understand that he is what? Without sin. The Bible tells us that even as a man, he is a man without sin. Hallelujah. He faced the temptation as a man. But he has, he has a holy nature. He was born of a woman, but he was not born of men and women. So he came, uh, he took the form of a man, and yet he was not uh, uh, prompt to sin because of his nature. By facing a temptation, the first one is, call, is calling him. I want to say to reconsider in his mind the his identity as a son of God. A question that is asked, this is Bible study, so I guess we can ask some of his questions and have you think a little bit. A question that is asked, and someone asked me this question actually this week. Pastor, could Jesus have sinned? It's not a very simple question in case you think that it's just trivial. No, it's not trivial. As a matter of fact, there are two School of thought. There are two positions on this. Just like there are things in the word of God that men will not understand until Jesus comes back and explains to us exactly what's happening. But you can take one position or the other. Could Jesus have sinned? Some will say yes. Some will say no. It depends on the perspective. It depends on how you look at it. If you look at it, this is what I'm saying. Okay? If you look at it from the perspective of God, of course he could not have sinned. Because he has no sin in him. He has a holy nature. It, from the perspective of God, he could not have sinned. And yet, he's brought in the wilderness to be tested. So, is God playing games? What is the temptation? What is the testing about if you can't fall? If there's no propensity for you to fall, why are you testing somebody? Why? Because he has also a human nature. That's true. He has a human nature. But he knows no sin, though, the Bible tells us. There's, no, there's no, nothing in him that will bring him to sin. The reason why we sin is because we have a sinful nature. Because we are from the first Adam, and sin came into the world, and we are regenerated sinners. Let me put it that way. If you give your life to Jesus, you are regenerated. You are not a sinner anymore. You sin, but I don't want to call you a sinner anymore, even though you still have this nature. Amen. Because if we go in that route and we uh, continue to think that we are sinners then it will be easy for us to sin and it will be easy for us to fall into sin. But I want to acknowledge that I have this nature that can fall, but yet I have a Holy Spirit in me that empowers me to overcome sin. 
I want to believe in my spirit that I am regenerated. I'm a different person. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, we, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creature. Behold, all things are gone. Now the new has come. He is a new creature. So he has a human nature. And that human nature was being tested. The question, we didn't answer the question. Can he, could, could, he, could he have sinned? I'm saying from God's perspective, no. But in the mind of Satan, yes. Satan believed that Jesus could sin. That's why he went to tempt him. The temptation was real. You, you see what I'm saying? This is what I'm saying. Over people may say something else. But I'm saying in the, in the mind of Satan, he could have sinned. That's why he went to him and said, I want you to fall. But Jesus did not fall. He did not fall. And he walked this walk perfectly. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. We now are like Jesus Christ. Because of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. The word says he was empowered. Uh, let me make the point. I think I made it, but I'm going to make it again. He did not resist the devil as God. Amen. He did not resist the devil as God. I had a discussion with brother when we were in Boston about this issue, about Jesus on the cross. How was Jesus, uh, uh, how did Jesus go through the cross? He, did, he, go through, he went through the cross as a man, not as God. For one thing, you could not have born, you could not have bore the sin of the world as God. Sin and God don't mix. And yet we know that on the cross, he, he bore our, uh, our, 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 our sin. It is as a man, my help by the Holy Spirit. It is important to understand that. Because we're going somewhere with this. If Jesus, empowered by the Spirit, lived a life of victory, then I want to walk like him. I want to do like him. I want to believe that I can do like him. That will bring me to a point where I will not accuse the enemy or the devil for everything. Amen. He did not sin. He walked this life of obedience perfectly. The first temptation is teaching us what is it exactly this first temptation is teaching us. The devil tells him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become loaves of bread. If you are the son of God, well, I guess his answer is clear. He said, men shall not live our bread alone. Incidentally, Jesus Christ fasted 40 days. He's hungry. And the devil come to tempt him in the, at his weakest point, 40 days without eating. Amen. Sometimes we do two days and we like, hello. Sometimes we do two days and get a big headache. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 40 days he didn't eat. Sometimes we do one week, you don't want to talk to anybody. You begin like, you become violent at home. Hey, hey, leave me alone. <laughs> I am fasting. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but fasting is always challenging for me. I'm just being honest. It's not like I like to eat that much, really. But it is what it is. <laughs> 40 days. This man, this man did not eat 40 days. And the devil comes and he begins to now play games with him. Jesus said, men shall not live by bread alone. Listen, the people of God were in the wilderness. 40 years they were in the wilderness, turning around and around. They were hungry. They began to complain to God. You see what's happening. The people of God are in the wilderness. They begin to complain to God because of food. God gives them the manna. They begin to eat the manna. And yet they disobey God. And yet they do not obey the word of God. Here is one who is hungry. For 40 days he has not eaten. And he says, no, men shall not live by bread alone. No, no. But by the word of God, he says, by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We must depend on God. 
That's how I read this text. He is God. He could have made bread. We saw him multiply bread for 5,000 people. He could have made bread. Why is he fasting 40 days? God doesn't need to fast. Does God need to fast? No. He could have made bread. He could have done everything he wanted to do. But no, he had a mission to accomplish. He has come, my friend, to show us, indeed, that obedience is what God is looking for. Obedience is what we must walk by. Men shall not live by bread alone. We must depend on God for our provision. Amen. We must depend on God. This is talking to us about depending on God. If Jesus himself depended on the Father, how much more you and I should depend on God? We should uh, overcome the desires of the flesh, the weakness of the flesh, and depend on God in every situation to provide for all our need. He came in perfect obedience. He came. If Jesus had not been perfect in his obedience, he would not have been a, a, uh, a what's the word? I want to use a simple word. He would not have been uh, uh, good enough to pay for our sins. He had to be perfect in obedience. He had to be perfect in everything. He had to be perfect in everything, every situation that he faced. He had to be perfect. And I have news for you, he was perfect in everything. Because we're talking about God. We're talking about God. And God made sure. God wanted a perfect lamb. God could have provided for himself a lamb from somewhere. But God chose a man because he wanted to save man. He chose a man. And yet this man had to be what? Perfect. 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 He was perfect in everything. And that's what we learned from him tonight. Amen. The first Adam, the one who married Eve, right? That's the first Adam. He's the one who married Eve. When you hear those two names, Adam and Eve, already you associate them with something bad. Is that right? When we hear Adam and Eve, we are already, I mean, one thing that comes to your mind when you hear Adam and Eve is what? Genesis 3. Therefore, Adam and Eve, they did not really obey the word of God. They did not do what God has called them to do completely. Jesus came to correct that. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus came to correct what Adam and Eve did. Or what, let me just leave Eve, Eve alone. Adam did. Because he was the head. He was the first Adam. The Bible never talks about the first Eve or the second Eve. It talks to us about the first Adam for a reason. He fell in the, in, in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the Garden of Eden. He fell in, they fell in the Garden of Eden where God gave them everything. Everything. Just like the people of God in the wilderness. You see, you, you see what, what's happening. God gave them everything. And, and yet they fell. Everything they had in the wilderness. Everything they had in the garden. And they fell. Jesus came to change that. But the devil does not change in the way he does things. He doesn't change. The same way he, 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 he went to Adam and Eve and tell, and tell them, has God really said this? It's the same thing. Has God really spoken this way? Has God really said this? He comes and he tells Jesus, if you are the son of God, do this. In other words, come and go against what God has sent you to do. Come and go against the purposes of God. This was important because if he had failed the test, so to speak, he would, not, he would have failed the mission and he would not have accomplished perfectly. It is something that you and I cannot understand. We cannot understand perfectly because God is God and we are men. 
We can understand this perfectly. But we can learn from it. You don't have to understand everything. Nobody understands everything in the Bible. We don't have to understand everything to learn from it and to obey it and to walk according to it and to do what it's called to do. If you are the son of God, sometimes it will come and touch on your identity. It will touch on what, who you're supposed to be really deep inside of you. If you are a child of God. Have you heard the devil speak, spoken to you like th that way before? In different ways he will do that. If you are a daughter of God. If you are a servant of God. If you are a pastor. If you are a, a this and that. If you are a child of God. Why is this happening to you? Why couldn't you do this? Why couldn't you do that? You've heard those before in different ways. It will put that in your spirit. But we learn from Jesus tonight that it is written that it's not by bread that we shall live, but by the very word of God. He says every word that comes from the mouth of God. Praise the Lord. He did not fail this first temptation. Get close to God and let his word be your food. Get close to God and let his word minister to you. Let's get close to God and let his word be more important than physical need, than food, like Jesus is saying. Let's get close to God. He said, listen, uh, uh, the, the, my mission is more important than everything else, anything else I should say. Amen. And we shall learn from this, my friend, that our mission, we also have a mission to accomplish. And our mission is to please God, and our mission must come first, and our mission shall prevail before anything else. The devil does not let go. He comes again, and he says, now I'm going to take you into Jerusalem, the city of God, the holy city. I'm going to take you there. I'm going to put you on top of a temple. And I'm going to now ask you to throw yourself down. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, and it, he knows the, the Bible. It, this is Psalm 91. The first verse was in Deuteronomy 8. Men shall not eat by bread alone. That's in Deuteronomy 8. The, the second one is in Psalm 91. Let me give you the verse. I have it here. Psalm 91, verse 11, and Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. If you read in Psalm 91, verse 11, what the, 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 the Satan is, what the devil is saying here, it's true. It's in the word of God. It is true that God has said that, but it's not in this context. It's not for us to take it as such. He said, if you throw yourself, we call this presumption. Is that right? Because God can protect me. I'm going to do this. We talked about this before. It's called presumption. Because God can uh, protect me, I'm going to throw myself. Jesus no, he said no. You shall not put the Lord your God to, be, to the test. In other words, you don't have to be presumptuous. That's what he's saying. Don't put God to the test. Don't, don't assume... That because, don't, don't assume that because God is merciful, you can sin. You, you see what I'm saying? Because God is merciful, because God is gracious, and God said he will forgive if I sin, I can sin. We can change it and put that in that context, the same thing. If he said if you, you, you let yourself down and you throw yourself down, the angel will protect you. But sin is falling too, in a different way. So if I just fall like this, yes, God who is merciful will forgive me. Well, yes, he is forgiving. Yes, he is merciful, but we don't presume on his mercy. We don't do things because we know that God, you see what I'm saying? It's like we know he's there, so we're just going to do it anyway, and he will forgive us. No. No. Jesus answered, and he answered correctly, church. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. But we must learn the second lesson as well. 
Not only everything that we are and everything that we do must depend on God, but we must also know that we are not to presume on God's faithfulness. We are not to presume on God's uh, 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 goodness and on and on. God shall not be put to the test. Temptation is the weapon that the enemy uses in every situation. I told you, it began with Adam. He failed the test. The people of God in the wilderness, they failed the test. The people of God in the time of Jesus, oh, never mind those. They failed the test big time. They didn't even recognize him. They failed the test. And he is uh, on a mission to drive you to fail the test. To fail the test in every area of your life, my friend. We keep talking about it, and it's important that you and I be discerning and be awakened, uh, be uh, 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 on, uh, uh, awakened spiritually. So that when the devil comes, we understand that this is a temptation. Amen. I told you that sometimes God will bring a test to us. Everything is not a temptation. Sometimes God will test you. God will allow you to be tempted, like it happened in the case of Jesus. We know another name, Job. Did God allow Job to be tempted by the enemy? But yet it was a test that God was submitting or uh, uh, sub, uh, subjecting Job to. Job. Did Job pass the test? I don't know. You, you think Job passed the test? Poor Job, right? Should we have a little pity on Job tonight? I don't know if he passed the test, really. Uh, there were times where Job began to really question things. Job took himself to be righteous to the point where, why are all these things happening to me? I am righteous. I do all these right things. Why is, are these things happening to me? Uh, I am righteous. Until God sat him down and began to talk to him. Job, when I was putting you in the womb of your mother, where were you? When I was creating this world. So I don't think he passed the test, really. But it's easy for me to say, Right? He didn't sin. What is sin? When you murmur, you sin. When you question God, you sin. But in the eyes of God, when you turn back, the behavior of God will let us understand that God favored Job all the way to the end. God in his mercy favored God, Job. He, I know at some point Job uh, uh, murmured. At some point Job as a human being. But when you look back, you understand that God restored him completely. Is that right? God looked favorably on him and God restored his children and God restored his, his riches and, and on and on. I don't think that God would have restored all that if he has not passed the test. Job was tested really in a very difficult way, in a very a difficult way. But God sustained him all the way. I'm making this transition to tell you that even though Jesus had no children, he had no wife, he had no, none of those things, but he was tempted in this wilderness. He was tempted in all regard. He was tempted all the time. Those 40 days, he was tempted. It wasn't just one day. Think about this. That the devil will constantly bombard you and constantly putting things on you, constantly touching you, and, and, and really inciting you to turn away from the mission that God has given you. This was not easy. And yet, he passed the test. He passed the test, just like Job passed his test. And we must also pass our test. 
we must pass our tests. Don't allow the enemy to win the battle. Because the one that you serve, the one that you worship, the one that you follow, the one that came before you, he did not allow the enemy to bring him down. I'm going to close. I'm sorry. Time is already gone. The next test, the devil took him on a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and do what? Look at where he's going. (laughs) You want to worship me. (laughs) If you worship me, I'll give you everything. Then Jesus said to him, be God, Satan, away from me. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you you shall what? Serve. I told you that one of the theme, the main theme in the gospel of Mark, in Mark 10, 45, he said the son of man did not come to be served, but to do what? To serve. As an example for us, he says, I came to serve God. How do you serve God? God is not here with us. How do you serve God? You serve God through serving the people of God. That's how you serve God. Jesus, Mark said, he came to serve, not to be served, but to serve. And we saw him serving God through serving people. He said, I have not come, no, for all this. I came to worship God. You shall worship the Lord your God, and he only you shall worship. Praise the Lord. Incidentally, we are talking about worship this month. Don't let the enemy tempt you to turn your worship into something else and to reduce you to someone who is only after God's pocket or after God's hand or someone who is after God. You know, just God will give me, give me, and give me. Worship him. Worship him. Praise the Lord. He is not only after Jesus. If you went after Jesus, he will come after you. I have news for you. He's already after you. But the good news is that when Jesus resisted the enemy all the way, like the words tell us, to resist him and he will do what? He will flee. Resist him and he will flee. How do you resist the enemy? He, he showed us the way. Through the word, knowing and believing the word of God and being Uh, What's the word? Being serious about honoring God. Being serious about fulfilling the mission of God over your life. You say, "Uh uh-uh, I know where I am going. I know what God has called me to do. I will not fail no matter what. Jesus passed the test, filled with the Holy Spirit. But as a man, you too can pass your test as a man or a woman. I'm saying man like a human being. You can also pass the test. Filled with the Holy Spirit. What, what is our take home? I like take homes, right? What, what is your take home? What are you taking home with you in your car today? Yes, I know you knew this story before you came today. I know you knew this. You knew that Jesus was tempted 40 days in the wilderness. I know you knew that. But what is your take home? What, what is it that this is teaching you? What is this that you're learning again that will help you uh, stand firm against the attack of the enemy? Jesus knew the word. Let me start with that, if anything. He knew the word. He said it is written three times. He said it is written. He made up his mind to be obedient and to, be, to obey God in all things. The word said he was tempted in all things, but he did not fail. You, too, will be tempted in all things. But as long as you stand on the word of God, as long as you are serious about fulfilling your mission, as long as you make up your mind to obey God, the spirit of the living God will help you. It will help you just like you helped Jesus go through it and win the victory. I said he came to correct what the first Adam did not fail to do, so to speak, right? Adam opened the door. He failed. He did not listen to the word of the voice of God. He listened rather to the voice of a serpent, to the devil.
We're going to pray as we close. One thing that we see is that God did not stop Satan from talking to Jesus into Jesus' ears. God did not stop him to do that, from doing that. Amen. He did not stop the devil from talking to, into Jesus' ears. It, it, it means he will not stop the devil from talking to you. Discernment. Number one, discernment. You're going to pray. If you're going to pass this test, my friend, you're going to be, have a discerning spirit. You're going to have a discerning spirit. This dialogue took place. I don't know how it happened, but it took place because we just read it. I don't know, if it's, I don't know how he spoke to him, but I know it took place. Nobody was there. How, how did we learn about this story? Jesus must have taught his disciples. Is that right? He was alone in the wilderness. Nobody saw him. He must have explained to them, this is what the devil did. This is what the devil attempted to do. This is how I overcame him. And that's the same way we must overcome him. By standing on our identity that the Lord has given us as children of God. If you are the son of God, yes, I am a child of God. I am an elect. I am part of a chosen generation, the royal priesthood. I am part of those that God has handpicked. You too are part of it if you believe it. You are part of it. You are part of those who have been commissioned by God to go around and change the world. Jesus was just starting his ministry. He was just starting his ministry. And he passed the test and he went on to do great things. That power is ours again today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your presence again in our lives. Thank you, Lord, again tonight that you teach us to depend on you. You teach us to trust in you in all things. You teach us to worship you and only you. In the name of Jesus, what good it is for a man to win the whole world and lose his soul, the word says. The kingdoms of this world. All that was presented to him, he said, no. Jesus, Help us, oh God. To follow Help Jesus. us, oh God. I have the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit I have to help you as you face any kind of temptation Jesus. from the enemy. No turning back. No turning back. Hallelujah. 